Our gospel reading comes from John, chapter 10, verses 11 to 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Ephesians 2, verses 13 to 22. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its, own, with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access to one spirit, to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together, spiritually, into a dwelling place for God. If you've ever been to John and Edna Stuckey's place, you probably know what it feels like to enter a slightly different sort of world. You turn off a dirt country road, through a line of trees, cross a little creek, and a log house enters your view, nestled among trees on one side and a clearing on the other. Speaking for myself, my visits to John and Edna's place always felt a bit like a retreat to green pastures and still waters. There is something about that place and the people who lived there that fostered a sense of peace and contentment. Peace and contentment in a larger world that is too often characterized by division, mistrust, and dissatisfaction. The scripture passages we just read all acknowledge the reality of some of these larger negative forces at work in our world. Ephesians refers to the hostility and division present between people of different backgrounds. The passage from John 10 expresses concern about how false shepherds and hired hands lead people astray and place them in vulnerable situations while shamelessly pursuing their own welfare. 
Indeed, few of us would argue with the observation that our world is divided. Divided by politics, by faith, by economic status, by ethnicity, and more. False shepherds are only too happy to whip up animosity and distrust among us if it feeds their power. And companies of all sorts project images of the good life that is available to us if we just buy their product and commit to a certain lifestyle. The hired hands and false shepherds of this world would have us believe that safety is found among those who look, think, and live like us. And that the good life can only be achieved through full participation in a consumerist system that markets a product or service for every need and desire. Well, God encourages us not to buy into this message. And John didn't buy into that message either. A glance around his family's small, lovingly built house with its wood-burning stove would tell you that much. John made their home to be about warmth and family, not about size or modern convenience or as a showcase for possessions. In his work on the farm and then in construction, John's interest was more focused on serving others rather than on making money, sometimes to the loving exasperation of his family. When building for clients, he always prioritized the projects of those he knew were in need and might not be able to pay. In a world that so often fosters division and mistrust, John extended gentle friendship and compassion to everyone he met. Even if all you did was spend five minutes visiting with John, you immediately sensed that here was someone who truly, genuinely cared. In a world that values efficiency, money, competition, and one-upmanship, John made it abundantly clear that he valued people and the things that nurture them. Green pastures, still waters, warm, solid homes, gentle humor, and most importantly, that love and compassion. Now, while his earthly humility would never have liked hearing so many good things said about himself, now that John is celebrating a new life among the saints, I think he wouldn't mind if we all took the liberty today. In many ways, John exemplified the sort of good life that God calls us to. We are all called to live lives that value eternally meaningful things over temporary things. People over power and possessions. Compassion over worldly forms of success. Jesus came to show us what this kind of good life could look like. With Jesus as our shepherd, we learn that the good life may involve being bound together with others as members of God's household that we had previously thought of as strangers and aliens. With Jesus as our shepherd, we learn that the good life may mean choosing to follow Jesus' values and leadership above all the others who try to convince us that they offer us the way to happiness and prosperity. 
With Jesus as our shepherd, we may learn that the good life may involve choosing a simple home, maybe even among green pastures, over that flashy residence at the center of town. With Jesus as our shepherd, we learn that the good life might involve giving up money, power, and control rather than grasping for it. After all, Jesus, our shepherd, gave up his life for us. John sought to build this kind of good life for himself, for his family, and he modeled it for so many others. While we all grieve that cancer prevented his life from being longer, we can't help but look at his life and marvel, but it was so good. From his time of service in Africa to raising two beloved children and with Edna in rural Mound Ridge, to his farming and building work, even into his two years of fighting cancer, John sought the sort of good life offered by Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Ask any of the patients, nurses, or doctors who encountered John at the cancer center in McPherson, and I'm sure they'll tell you that John's commitment to extending compassion to everyone remained strong even when he was in the middle of chemotherapy. No one felt like a stranger around John. There were no strangers or aliens. Just like his home stands out in its peaceful beauty, pointing towards a different way of life, John lived his life choosing a different sort of way, that good, Christ-like sort of way. And so as we reflect and give thanks for John's life this morning, our challenge is to also consider our own lives. What kind of shepherd will we follow? What version of the good life will we pursue? We may not have much control over the quantity of life that we receive, but God certainly gives us lots of choices with regards to the quality of life that we will enjoy. Will we think of our work as a way of making money? or as a form of service? Will we focus more on the love we pour into our families or on the money we pour into the appearance of our homes and possessions? Will we model our lives after shepherds that say, me first? Or after the good shepherd who gave up his life? for his flock. When we come to the end of our earthly lives, will we look back with our loved ones and say, life was good. It may have been different or difficult or shorter than we expected. But thanks to ample doses of things that make for God's kind of good life, love, peace, generosity, natural beauty, compassion, simplicity, and more, life was so good. Granted, our best, fullest life awaits us when we enter God's presence in heaven, that life beyond death. 
Yet most of the Bible is dedicated to helping us choose the good life here and now in the earthly time that we have been given. John made many choices to follow this biblical kind of good life. And I'm guessing that we're all here because at some point, John shared a taste of his compassion and his green pasture life with us. So may we too be inspired to choose the good life that God, our good shepherd, offers. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, your faithfulness extends through all generations. Your persistent desire is to gather us all up into one household founded upon Jesus Christ. You shepherd and guide us towards this kind of living here on earth, pointing out the good life that can be found among our families, our neighbors, and our communities. When our earthly lives are over, you promise to welcome us into a new household, bigger and more wondrous than anything we can imagine, where we may live in perfect fellowship with you and with our fellow saints. As we grieve John's loss from his family's household, his church, and this community, Comfort us with visions of the heavenly household and community into which you have welcomed him. Fill our hearts with love and compassion for those who surround us, that we might have a foretaste of the wondrous fellowship you are calling us to here on earth and preparing for us in heaven. May we live our lives with joy relishing each person and each opportunity for love and compassion that you place in our path. And may we live our lives with hope, anticipating a full and perfect reunion with beloved saints like John, living in your eternal presence. Strengthened by the faith hope and love that comes only from you. We pray in your name. Amen. <laughs>